So why I do what I do. So, um, of course. So the layout of tonight is going to be, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about high frequency vibration, also known as VPRO5 clinical research, kind of why I use it and how I use it um, and why I use it, how I use it. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of cases that um, is really more of a global conversation um, than just showing you clinical cases. I'm going to show you clinical cases and executed uh, clinical results, but I want to have some real deep thought into why I use vPro5 um, on all of my adult and teen Invisalign patients um, and why I use it on a lot of my adult orthodontic patients for pain. Um, and then I'm gonna go into some microosteoperforations. Uh, I tried to upload a video from this morning when I did a MOPS procedure on a 65 year old or 68 year old lady. I uh, got kind of stretched out and a little funky, but I'm going to bust out and then show you that video either at the end or I'll get out of the PowerPoint and show it to you, kind of show you clinical technique um, and what I do for that, and then show you a few cases. So where do I practice? Uh, I'm in Lake Forest, Illinois, in Round Lake Beach, uh, a little north of Chicago Center City. Um, two locations, two practices, two entirely different demographics. Uh, I run pedo ortho practices. I'm the orthodontist. There's P three pediatric dentists. Uh, Lake Forest population is affluent. Round Lake Beach population is not uh, two sides of the coin. So I kind of, um, I obviously treat to the same standard in both locations, but the angle of attack is a little bit different, um, which is a conversation for a different time. So this is where we are in a map. Uh, just north of Chicago, go Cubs, uh, just south of Milwaukee. So I'm going to show you some ClinChecks. Uh, I was a ClinCheck idiot, uh, I will admit it. Uh, really decent at Damon PSL mechanics. I never really treated in plastic until a few years ago regularly. Um, I have to thank these two goofballs for helping me out. Um, they held my hand for about 50 clean checks and really taught me how uh, to do some work in Invisalign. Um, I am grateful for that. They have an aligner fellowship, minor intensive fellowship. If you have not done it, do it. It's worth every penny. I don't even know what they charge, but whatever they charge, it's worth it. So a little plug. So high frequency vibration, VPRO5. Um, VPRO5 is this little dude right here. They just uh, reworked it. It's uh, had some breakage is issues in in the beginning. Um, those are all but gone. Um, I love this thing. It comes in a new box, which is a lot easier to hand out with Invisalign. Uh, we hand out all of our aligners in, in our practice when aligners come in. Um, I set them up on... Uh, 26, 36, 46, uh, seven day intervals, which I'll get into. But the new box that the VPRO5 comes in is pretty much the same size as an Invisalign box. It's thinner, but it's the same footprint. And we give those out uh, in branded lunch totes. So I like the new box. I really like the, the VPRO5. So what is a clinical research? I'm gonna, I'm not a researcher. Um, I obviously interpret research and apply it to my clinical practice, and some of this stuff is uh, really cool. So uh, there was uh, some studies that show um, that high-frequency vibration, VPRO5, uh, increases bone remodeling markers. So there was this uh, prospective randomized controlled study, 60 subjects. Um, really cool stuff. So what they use is they use, so the seven sham was kind of a, a control. It was a placebo. And then they did um, seven days with VPRO5, five days with VPRO5, uh, average 14 day control, which used to be the old Invisalign standard. Um, and then the seven days plus placebo is like a, a fake VPRO5. And then they did a five day plus uh, that placebo. And the all the patients that were in the five day plus placebo at regular velocities of tooth movement bailed out because it was too painful. So I'm going to roll through um, this 
pretty quick, but it's pretty important stuff um, because if you look at seven days, you know, not slowed velocities, regular velocities in orthodontic tooth movement with Invisalign, seven days plus VPro5 had the lowest level of discomfort, meaning the aligners didn't hurt as much out of all, all groups. So um, aligner accuracy and discomfort are two entirely different things, but there is an overlap. The five day plus VPro had 84% uh, accuracy of movements, meaning 84% of the movements, you know, not doctored up, movements happen. That was the same number as the old Invisalign 14 day change. So the two week change and five day and VPro 5, you get the same accuracy. A little more uncomfortable um, when you did that, but you got the same accuracy. If you did a one week switch out, which is the new Invisalign, uh, switch out as of what a year and a half ago um, without the VPro, you only had a 70% accuracy. So it always kind of, you know, questions without altering velocities um, of 70% of your movements work out. So we're being smart and creative. And I used to slow velocities down 30% and do one week switch outs with really good predictability. And now I don't do that anymore. And I use a VPro 5. Um, and I get, as this study shows, a 90, I'd probably say it's more, 90% predictability of movements. And there's five movements that um, aren't as predictable um, that I do alter the clinch check just slightly and slow those movements down to keep up with it. But so seven days in VPro5, 90% predictable in movements. I mean, that's a pretty good thing to build a, a clinical uh, protocol off of. So when you look at it, so that's what I do. I do across the board seven days, and no decrease in velocities with the V Pro 5. And these things, high frequency vibration seats the aligners like crazy. When you look at tooth movement or you know rate of tooth movement in, in microns, and you look at that third line down, I mean, seven days, um, plus the VPro5 was 28% faster than the seven days, which only had a 70% predictability. Um, it was 28% faster than that. And it's not about speed. You know, I don't, and I, and I know with accelerated orthodontics, everybody says, oh, we got to finish faster. I don't really have a problem finishing faster, or having a huge patient base that comes in that wants to be done tomorrow but they do want it in a certain time period and they want it to work out. So it's all about predictability. But if you look at the seven days plus V Pro 5 and the five day plus V Pro 5, I mean, significantly faster rate of tooth movement with more predictability. I personally would rather take 90 plus percent of the movements happening versus 84% faster and then rely less on my refinements to, to reset. Um, but there are some practitioners out there that would rather take the 84% get there quicker and then reset it in a refinement. Um, you know, they, it all kind of works. And so this kind of demonstrates that increased rate of tooth movement um, with accuracy and speed. These are 14 days Invisalign's old uh, switch out then the one week switch outs with accuracy and speed. And then what I do uh, primarily seven day with VPro5, which is predictable, accurate and fast. Um, or, you know, you can kind of push the envelope and then run it with uh, five days plus VPro5. I do five or four or five day switch outs when I use micro osteoperations with it. If the patient is in a rush, which I'll show you a case that uh, I recorded the, the video off of this morning where she's in a rush. We have a wedding in the fall and we gotta get to a certain point so she can get some veneers and look great uh, on her photos for her daughter's wedding. Uh, you know, it kind of is what it is. I don't have a huge uh, 
patient population that requests that, I might have 30 or 40 of those patients a year, which is not a big percentage. So I don't build a lot of protocols around it. I know Thomas Shipley down in Arizona does a lot of that stuff and, you know, I love it. I just, I just don't have the demand. I haven't built a practice around it. So conclusion, um, you can improve accuracy while reducing the interval for aligner changes. And VPRO5 also has been shown to reduce pain and discomfort because of uh, the movement of the PDL with inflammation markers. So Donna K. Um, and underneath it says SDC. Everyone's like, oh crap, you know, we're gonna talk about Smile Direct Club again. And so that's like the negative around um, the profession recently with Smile Direct Club. And I, I don't like it as much as the rest of the, per rest of the people out there, but you know, rising tide raises all ships. These people are out there that want, you know, better. They don't want perfect, they want better. So I'm gonna show you one case that I saw all the way back in 2013, this 54 year old lady that came in and said, I don't like my upper front teeth. And said, all right, great. So I'm an orthodontist. I look at it and I'm like, oh man, you know, your class two, div two, 100% deep by crowding, collapsed arches. You know, and this for a, a Damon PSL case is pretty straightforward. It's, you know, bite buildups on upper fours and disclusion and early light elastics and rounding out of arches and torque and selective torques. And that all works out. And that's all I saw and tried to, you know, sell her that product and she you know flaked out on me she didn't come in um chased her she went to long-term pending and then walked back through my door three years later and she said in the consult and i'm like well I, you know you're ready to get your braces started she's like no you didn't listen to me the first time and she was like i don't want braces and i don't like my upper front teeth okay well let's let's do invisalign and then she goes well I, you know, I don't care about bite correction. I don't care about this. I don't care about that. And she goes, and I don't really want to be in treatment for more than a year. And I'm like, great. Oh, and I don't want attachments on my front teeth. I've been doing some research and I do not want those bricks on my front teeth. I, I don't, I don't want to do that. So I'm like, great. Well, you know, I'm not sure where we can get without attachments and, you know, a really deep bite retrocline incisors, I know we can use some power ridges and torque those out and, you know, we'll do the best that we can. So this was her ClinCheck, you know, power ridges. We did some attachments on the side just to kind of anchor it. I did lingual or palatal attachments um, on her upper twos. Kind of the first time that I did it, you know, it, just trying to get an anchor on that tooth to hold the aligner up, um, you know, the, the force vectors and glosses didn't make a ton of sense. Um, but we're gonna give it a shot. So I said, here's the deal. I'm gonna give you this high frequency vibration device. You're gonna wear your aligners, you know, 21 hours a day and we'll we'll get there. We'll get the best that we can. So here was her, her predicted, where she started, where she predicted it's fake IPR in the bottom, just to keep those spaces closed. I knew she was not gonna get here, um, but we were trying to bump her in this direction. So, you know, early on, you know, I wasn't doing seven day changes on these patients that wanted to get speedy. We jumped right into five. So we had 47 aligners in 235 days because she had to be done by a certain point. You know, I jumped her to five day changes and she said the, you know, the aligners were okay. They were a little uncomfortable. Here's where she was at aligner 16. So you can see that, you know, she's not fully tracking on her upper anteriors. You can see the gap between her two to two. Still not bad though, without attachments and working out these torquing movements. And I was like, listen, you are you wearing your V Pro 5? Well, yeah, well, most of the time, but you know, I, I kind of forget sometimes. And I'm like, the only way this is gonna work out is if you seat your aligner and we get as squeeze as much out of this clean check as possible. So here's where she was when she came back at 27 aligners, you know, 27 of 47, she's more than halfway done. And I'm like, listen, your torquing movements are not working out. Those power ridges can only work out if they get to the cervical of the tooth. The only way that happens is if your teeth fully seat in the aligner. You have to wear your V-Pro 5 in your aligners or 
you're not going to get there. What, you know, what I promised at the beginning is this was a, a team effort. If you don't wear it, you're not doing your part and I won't be able to deliver on my promise. So here's where she was with her aligners out at that 27. Still not bad. Some improvement to her. Things are going in the right direction. Like she doesn't understand um, until I told her I wasn't going to be able to get there. Here's where she comes back. 36 weeks. She finally got some dental religion, as I like to call it. And she is wearing her V-Pro 5 and the aligners now are seated and the torquing movements really are starting to work out. So there's where she was at 36. At 47, she goes, we're done. She goes, you have accomplished what you promised. My front teeth are straight. And I was like, well, your arch form on the bottom and you're still a little edgy on the lower left four and you still have a little bit of an overbite and I still want to open your bite. She's like, we're done. Take off my attachments today. So this is a smile direct club type patient that we're in control of. Do I love this finish? No, absolutely not. Um, would I do it time and time and time again if the patient knew the expectations? Absolutely. V Pro 5 aligners with a you know a decent clean check so that's kind of where she traveled from in her her five uh inch oral photos so these are the only five times that i saw this patient outside of the initial new patient exam it was the day i took her money for her contract the day that we delivered and then these time points and i gave her a double set of essex retainers that were delivered on my staff day and that's it so 47 aligners five day changes 33 weeks and she paid a full fee so since this point i don't charge a full fee for these smile direct club type patients um, I will show you what I got paid and I'll show you the profitability, but if you were to decrease your fee on this patient demographic and they get what they get and they don't get upset, um, it's still extremely profitable. So on average, uh, we're about uh, $1,500 to $1,800 lower than our full fee on these types of patients. And if they want to upgrade to a full finished product, then they have that option to do that before their their refinement. Um, very few of them actually take you up on it. So this is what I got for a full fee for adult Invisalign for a year at that point. And when you look at 6,300 bucks and you take out my Invisalign lab bill and my V Pro 5, I mean, that's uh, almost five grand. And if you look at that in profitability, that's 900, that's almost a thousand bucks, 996 bucks a visit. And I saw her when we put the attachments on, when I cleaned up flash and when I took the attachments off. The only other time I saw her was in passing when all the, all the uh, aligner visits, uh, you know, um, these types of patients or teen Invisalign or, or you name it in my practice, all of the check Invisalign get progress records. They go in with my records coordinators. They get uh, aligners in, aligners out photos, and they come in to make sure their attachments are intact and they're tracking. I have clinical coordinators that say they're tracking or they're not. If they're not, I come over, I analyze, and we figure out if we need to do a reboot. Uh, very, very rare in my practice, or if they're going in the right direction. Other, otherwise, you know, I, I pretty much wave at them from across the clinic while I'm treating braces patients. So, you know, thousand bucks a visit, and only two of those really require doctor time. I'll take it. So, I think everybody, you know, poo poos SDC. I think you have to kind of be in control of this patient base. I have tons of uh, Smile Direct Club. Um, second opinions that come in that want a doctor overseeing it and they're willing to pay for more um, at least in my area you know they're not willing to pay you know sixty three hundred dollars on a regular basis but they'll pay forty five to fifty two hundred dollars all day long for that type of um, of care so second type of case with high frequency vibration kind of you know, the other uh, topic out there in this day and age is uh, teledentistry, remote orthodontics. And so this lady um, is my mom, 
uh, I used her as an example because I had to document it because um, she lives 1,200 miles away from where I live right now. So uh, she's always had that overlap central incisor uh, ever since she was a kid. She always wanted to fix it, and my father always convinced her that it was fine. It was who she was, and she finally turned uh, 62 and said, you know what? enough of that i'm going to fix it after me trying to get her into treatment for 15 years um, so i treated her remotely she lives south of boston um, she came in for a few visits and i kind of uh, kicked everything out remotely she would send me photos of her case as it was tracking so here was her clin check nico helped me with this clin check um, I did not listen to a few things that he told me to do because I knew better, which I obviously didn't. And it still worked out anyway because high frequency vibration fully seated the aligners. She was obviously compliant, but I had to unfold it to uh, decrowd her upper central incisors, which have been overlapped. So we expect a black triangle, her upper right one has been retroclined for a long time and it's worn down. She's missing a lower incisor. She knocked it out as a kid, so we knew there was gonna be a Bolton. So the goal was to run some class two elastics to open her bite, intrude lower incisors, erupt uh, premolars, uh, advance upper incisors to the fact that I could decrowd them, IPR upper three to three, and then retract. So this was her, predicted her initial on the left her predicted on the right um you can kind of see you know really really ag aggressive thinking without uh horizontal gingival beveled attachments on lower fours and fives and a huge overcompensation but i believed that we could get there and i delivered her aligner so here's where she was when we first delivered her aligners bonded some buttons in her lower sixes ran some class two elastics. And you can see, you know, obviously plastic can't get in between upper central incisors uh, because they're overlapped. So I have to advance her upper right central incisor. Upper left central incisor has to come labial first then the upper right one kind of has to walk out and around it. Um, and so I can get that contact so I can get some IPR and then I can get a rescan and really wrap it in plastic. So she had some power ridges, her upper central, she had some sash attachments on her upper twos. Um, and then she had, this is where she was um, when her first uh, visit, where she came to visit the grandkids. Um, things are looking pretty decent. This is how her aligners fit, how they seated. I mean, pretty good for that level of overlap you can see the central starting to to roll out you can see her class two or bite starting to open i programmed uh extrusion in her lower sixes to anticipate what the elastics were going to do here's where she was at her second visit you can see that upper right one really is starting to walk its way around almost cleared the contact we know there's going to be a big ugly black triangle there when she comes out you know uh this is that last one is where uh i scanned her for a refinement and she came back and this is when i delivered her refinement so you can see i got enough of a grab where i could get into proximal with her upper central so if you look here you can see that i'm intruding her upper cent upper right central incisor to level the gingival margin so i can set her up for a veneer um, that lower incisor that has a crown on it um, was compromised, uh, but we were going to give it a go. If she lost a lower tooth, she lost a lower tooth, but I did not have a ton of movements on that lower central as we kind of opened her bite. So here's where she was with her aligners in. Here's where she was when I slenderized her upper central incisors. Um, I used a, a Comet disc. They have a really nice distance kit out there that I helped beta for them. Uh, I get nothing from them for mentioning their name, but I do think it's a really nice disc kit that's out there. Comes in an aluminum burr block, um, and it's really, really nice. It makes IPR really easy. 
So here's where she was when I slenderized and rebooted her, rescanned her so I could really wrap the inner proximal. And I kept all the attachments on and I mailed her her aligners in the mail. Um, and then here's where she was when we were just about finishing up. You can see nice class one occlusion, bite is opening, her upper uh, central incisors looking better. I walked them out. Um, here's where she was towards the end. Um, upper incisors still a little retroclined, but I'm okay keeping them a little upright to, to mask the class two or the overjet. I would rather compensate that than hold her in retention with a with an Essex with a small bite plate on it at night, um, then to leave her with overjet and then have her tongue get in there and create all sorts of other issues. I was pretty happy with her arch form at this point. So you can kind of see how we traveled. Uh, it's going up and down on the left side, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this was all remotely. I only saw her these six times for rescans or adjustments for IPR and just really she came out to see the grandkids and I would mail her her aligners and she would just insert them and chew on the V-Pro 5 every day and it worked out really well. I mean, look at the arch form for remote treatment. I mean, with this level of predictability, yeah, she was obviously a compliant patient, but there are a lot of compliant patients out there. If you can get them on your side with, in, with Invisalign um, and VPro5 and make sure that their ClinChecks work out, I mean, it's pretty decent. So I'm happy with the way that her aligner is seated and 100% is because of VPro5 and a smart ClinCheck. So I thank Miko for that one. So she had 71 aligners. She was on seven day changes because I didn't use my osteo perforations and I couldn't really uh, risk her not tracking from afar um, since she had, had to fly out to get reboot, right? So we did seven day changes, 71 weeks, 504 uh, um, days. And then I saw her five times. Um, she obviously paid nothing, so my profitability per case was, <laughs> was uh, negative. It was in the red. Um, but it's still really nice to be able to treat that kid that goes to boarding school or the kid that goes off to college that's a general, like a basic Invisalign case that you know if they wear their uh, V-Pro5 and their aligners that things work out over 90% of the time. That's a really good feeling for flexibility, for uh, global flexibility where people relocate. You know, I, I treat some some people that work in Chicago but live somewhere else and they fly in and I see them every three or four months and they come in for visits and we treat them that way. Really gives us um, a, a lot of opportunities. So micro osteoperforations. Uh, I started with the Accelerator RT on the left uh, a few years ago, maybe about three or four years ago, and didn't love it. I thought it was clunky. You know, I placed um, probably close to a thousand TADs, so I'm really familiar with TAD drivers. I placed Vector TADs from Ormco. Um, really familiar with the TAD driver, and I was like, oh, it's like a TAD driver, not a big deal. The collar was a little clunky, and I'm a little aggressive when it comes to that stuff, so I used it for maybe 20 or 25 patients and then switch to the power driver, um, the accelerator. It's really easy. They're gonna, I'm gonna show you how I set it up. Um, I don't use it for TADS, I just use it for, um, for microosteal perforations and I don't set it up the way that they have it here. And I'll show you that video and you'll see how it's set up. I actually have the head, because you can install the head, it's an autoclavable contra-angle contra tip. I have the head, set up at about a 30 degree angle to the main body of the driver. So I want this thing to fit in my palm. I want my thumb to go towards that power button. I'll show you some instructions. That power play button, um, which is right beneath the black collar. But I want the tip to face away from me because I want to turn it on and off and I want to use leverage in my wrist. It's kind of like your, your um, you're fly fishing. You've got to kind of like snap your wrist or any of those golfers out there, like when you release the club, it's like all in the wrist. So when uh, I do these procedures, I want my palm to be the control and I want my thumb to be the lever to push it down. 
and I'll show you a video as to how that happens. But that thing's worth its weight in gold in my practice. I didn't love the accelerator. Some people love it. It just wasn't my thing. And so microosteoperforations, you perforate, you, you make small holes um, with either of those appliances through the cortical plate, through the gingival tissue, through the cortical plate, and it causes trauma. And the trauma causes inflammation, and the inflammation causes the body to go, oh, well, let's repair something. And it softens the bone up in that area. Um, the effect is regional. They say six to 10 millimeters. I bet you it's 10 millimeters all day long. Um, and I'll show you because I don't place three perforations between each tooth. I only do two, so I'm betting that it's 10 millimeters. Um, and it says how many. Remodeling is proportional to the insult. More is more. To a certain point, though, if you're going 10 millimeters, you don't need to put 4,700 of these things in, which I'll show you. Um, and how deep. So they say just go through the cortical bone. I actually go deeper than that. I go, on average, about four millimeters. This is tactile sense and it's all repetitive procedures. Do I know if it's 3.67 millimeters or 4.5? I don't, but I go about four millimeters and I have visual cues uh, when I place them. So this is a, an old slide um, and I use it to demonstrate kind of what they suggested back uh, when I first got started and some people still do this, that in the buckle segments they said, put two interproximally between each tooth. So if you think if it's a 10 millimeter regional effect, if you put it 10 millimeters up from the, the gingival crest or the, the papilla, and then you go another 10 millimeters up, and then it goes 10 millimeters mesial and 10 millimeters distally, you pretty much cover that side of the root in the bone interproximally um, goes in. I have a slightly different alteration of this now and it depends upon what movements I have but I do two perfs in between each tooth that I want to move I don't do three like the one on the front is showing you as it has three uh, mesial and distal to the lateral incisors I only do two I start my first micro osteo perforation um, a little bit lower than um, they have shown on here, I started at the crest and then I go up 10 millimeters and it's pretty good. So in the lower anterior, I still only do one in between each tooth. It's just the roots are really small. The, the interproximal space is really small. So um, I only do one. So depth, they're saying three millimeters in these areas and seven to five in the back. I do use it on edentulous ridges and I will do uh, bicortical perforation, which I'll show you a case of that. But other than that, I go four millimeters across the board. I do not want to think about it. So four millimeters across the board, I keep it really, really uh, simple. So here's the one from this morning. Ronnie, she came in uh, 68 years old, you know, ton of recession. Uh, she was sent to me by a prosthodontist in the area. She's getting veneers. So he needs veneer clearance. He needs some rounding out of the arch forms. He needs me to get her bite clearance to protect the porcelain in the anterior. He needs upper anteriors intruded, lower anteriors intruded, and she has a wedding at the end of October. So I told her the only way this is going to happen is with microosteal perforations in VPRO5. So this is where she was today when she came in. I'll blow up the photo just to kind of show you. She's early on in treatment. She just switched into her fourth aligner. This is a you know, five minute procedure once they're anesthetized, um, pretty straightforward. So I use uh, a compounded um, local uh, topical anesthetic, and then I do local inf infiltration with uh, septicane in a super short needle. So staff dries mucosa, puts on the tack for four minutes, then I come back and then I, I infiltrate and really numb up the area. The anesthesia is the worst part of this um, for them. I have no problem administering it. I'm in a pedo ortho practice, so I have anesthesia all the way around. I would rather have them comfortable once I go in. I've done this with just topical compounded and I'm I'm, they're fine with it most of the time, um, but I'm not fast enough to, 
to really get through it. And every once in a while, they'll feel a little bit on the on the distal if I don't quite get it there, the assistant doesn't quite get it there. So predictability, because uh, you know, I want to jump in and and roll some anesthesia and then just perf and then and then uh, have it comfortable for the patient and comfortable for me while I'm doing the procedure. So the technique they say to turn it on and that the tip is at 90 degrees. I don't do it at 90 degrees uh, closer to the papilla. I'll show you a, a little diagram. I do it 90 degrees at mid root. I put my palm of my hand um, down near where the power button is. It won't turn, you have to really press it. So it's not like your hand's gonna turn it off. And then I put my thumb, I have big hands um, near the the play button which is the on and off button this squirrely button that's right above rpm that you can see is the reverse button so if you're a power driver and you're you're rolling your perf you got to stop at a certain point you have to hit that reverse button and so you hit the play button or you hit the go button you get in you hit the go button again to stop it you have to hit the reverse button and then you hit the play button again and it backs it out. So I'll show you a video as to how I do that. I don't use it like they've shown, like it's a, like a pen um, or like a hand piece. I use it in my palm. So you can see the perfs. <clears throat> I only put one in the center when they have low frenum attachments here, but you can see the multiple perfs. So if you look at the blue arrow, that is the one that is 90 degrees or perpendicular to the cortical plate. That one goes in straight. The one, the black arrow, I angle it about 40 degrees. And if you look at the diagram on the lower right-hand corner, this was from an edentulous ridge um, slide that I pulled off, but it demonstrates it's at an angle. So I come in on those first crest microosteoperforations and I go right through the crest in between the teeth so it goes deep four millimeters it probably comes really close to the lingual or the palatal side of that crest and then I do one four millimeter that's where the blue arrow is in between each tooth lower anterior I just roll one four millimeters deep also probably comes pretty close to the lingual cortical plate I don't love to do um, lingual mops on the lower, um, just because there are tongues all over the place and I gotta get in and gotta get out. And so I typically go from the buckle, but that's the angle that I take. Um, and I'll show you the video as to, to what that is. But here's where she was. You could see, uh, just trying to keep the back teeth locked in. So I did four to four, going after incisor intrusion just to try to open her bite for veneers. I'm gonna get her at the prep stage. She is on four day switch outs now that she's gone through here um, and she has um, 36 liners. So we'll get her to the prep stage this round. She'll get her veneers on. Once her veneers are on, I'll refine her and then finish up the movements and get in and get out. So that is where she was. Um, Curtis, so I'll show you bicortical perforation. So Curtis, this, this dude came in, he's about six foot three. He was a Marine instructor. Um, I tried to do him a solid. He had a bombed out lower right central incisor, endo, fail, um, came in, bimax, spaces, had never had braces before, but obviously didn't brush his teeth amazingly well when he was a youngster, had some decalcification. Solid dude, uh, young, really thick morphology. You can see lower lower right one, it's got a perilous on the front, it's draining abscess. So I was like, oh, I'll be the hero. We'll take out a lower incisor. Um, he did not want Invisalign. He said he wasn't responsible enough so I used Damon braces on him and I treated him as a lower incisor extraction. So you can see it's bimax, upper one to SN is 115 degrees. Um, lower one doesn't say on here. I bet it's about 105. So we're going to retract lower incisors, retract upper incisors, close the space, except a little bit of overjet. So there's a failing endo, lower right one. So 
we took it out and I started closing space. You know, when you extract an incisor and you tell a service dentist, don't compress the plate, and they say that they didn't, you have to kind of believe them. What I think happened is I think because of the abscess, um, I think the plate, the buckle plate, was was pretty weak already and when he went to take it out he took a portion of the buckle plate with it so there was a invagination indentation and um i couldn't close that space so i used uh microosteal perforations to kind of like bail me out here and i did two microosteal perforations right in the evagination right through the cortical plate um one typically where I do it, and then one a little bit lower. And bicortical means like I went through whatever was left of the buccal plate and it came out the lingual. So in a little deeper than four millimeters, because I needed to evoke as much trauma as possible. Um, so I had to do that procedure twice. So I kind of ran out of gas and I had to go back in and give him a, another uh, perforation after about three months. So here's where we were when we finished up. And you can see that I got the root parallel and we closed the space and uh, the substitution or the lower incisor extraction worked out really well in this case. So you can see retract incisors, left them with a little bit of overjet. Um, that was about as good as I could do on his upper incisor, retroclined it slightly. Did a little bit of slenderizing, but without taking out upper buys, which I would never do um, in an adult male like this with spacing to start. You know, I'm a hero sometimes, but not that heroic. So um, I think we treated him in about 14 months uh, from where he started to where he is now. So that's where he was. So. Here is one of my first learning cases with microosteal perforations and uh, high frequency vibration. So Chris is the um, CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Like this dude's a baller, right? But he's got a crazy crossbite. He's got facial asymmetry. Um, he's got a, a lot of things going in the wrong direction. So it's class three on the left, it's class one on the right. It's a lot of crowding. Upper midline is off to the left, his nose is off to the right, his you know, chin point is off to the right as his lower midline, and he wouldn't accept upper braces. He wouldn't accept um, lower braces at first either, but I convinced him um, to do some microosteal perforations, let me put some lower braces on, and kind of upright that lower left segment, upper Invisalign, class three elastic, soften the bone and kind of walk it around the corner. So that was the plan. So Damon braces on the bottom, Invisalign on the top, running class three elastic. So I'm IPRing on the lower, I'm creating a little bit of space to kind of cheat my movements just a little bit while I'm trying to upright his upper incisors. Um, so here's where we were. There's a ton of progress photos. So I'm going to flip through them uh, just to kind of get to the end point and show you how I transitioned this case. So I got here without microosteo perforations, just walking his lower uh, left segment back to get some of his midline, doing some IPR to get some of his midline. Um, here's where we ended up without mops. Not bad. He wore his elastics at night. As you can see, he's overcorrected on the right segment, all dental movements, right? So I'm uprighting upper incisors as the class three elastics are trying to flare. And then this is when we were go time. So this is mops. I did mops in the lower left segment and the upper left segment. I kind of started in the upper left one. He also had a cant, so I wanted to do some asymmetric intrusion. I wanted that bone to get soft as I worked everything back to the left. So that's where he was. He was a big baby. He didn't love the micro osteo perforations. Even my assistant today was like, you know, the 68 year old lady was a trooper compared to this, you know, 50 year old man. Um, so men are typically wimps. So pick your demographic. Well, um, females are stronger than we are. So when you kind of look at where I did the, the mops at this point, I was still going about four millimeters. Uh, I was doing two 
per per spot. Uh, kind of chickened out on the lower left four or five because that lower left five root was angled a little measly, so I just held off on it. Um, this is where he was at his next progress. You can see that left segment is now class one, and I let his right segment relapse back from that class two back to a class one. So now I'm getting my midline closer. The upper uh, incisors are upright and they're looking better. We're getting really close. Here's where the next progress, a little unsettled in the back. And then he begged me to take off his lower braces and finish him in Invisalign. I probably should have done the whole case in Invisalign from the get-go, but you live and you learn. So this is where he was at his progress, or when I took his lower braces off and scanned him for a refinement. No big deal, a little more IPR, continue my movements. Um, and you can see what happened on the lower right four. It's like a uh, watermelon seed, slippery watermelon seed. I had a horizontal rectangular attachment and it just lost it from the aligner. Um, so at this point, he's on high frequency vibration, um, but I have to be smarter about the ClinCheck. So I rebooted him and put him on vertical elastics. And you can kind of see, I couldn't get that lower right forward without some vertical elastics and buttons. Um, I use clear elastics, uh, clear buttons now, but this was back when I was using adhesive with trans bond with mold formers. But this is kind of where I got this case and then this is where his final was, you know, posterior will settle in, but I got him here, an asymmetric class three with uh, overbite with the help of micro perforations and uh, with high frequency vibration. Not a bad finish, upper right canine could be a little settled in. Uh, I've seen him in retention, he's holding stable, um, but this is the type of stuff that localized microosteoperforations and high frequency vibration will really help you out with. Um, I'm gonna roll to that um, video in a second so you can kind of see my technique of using it. Um, my pre-workout energy drink, caffeine, kind of hit me just a little, so I blew through that a little bit faster than I should have, but let me get out of this for one second and then get into this video so you guys can see it because I think it will help you. So I use these opter gates. So I use an opter gate, uh, which you can buy through Shine or Patterson. I use them on all bond repositioning visits because it really gives me direct visualization to segments. I use them for laser and I use them for TADs and I use them for microosteoperforations. Uh, they're pretty good. So you can kind of see that my, my uh, ham hock or my big meat hook of a hand is on uh, the, the driver. Uh, everything's been anesthetized, it's literally just suction, getting in there, keeping the blood and the spit out, um, and then I'll show you through. So you can see that I, I have the, the play button, right? I just hit reverse. So I have my thumb in the play button. I'm using my palm as, as leverage, and I'm literally just pushing it down. Then when I, when I get it down, I flip it out. I hit the reverse button, I hit the play button, and then I just kind of back it out. There, goes in. This is that 45 degree angle that I showed you about at the interproximal. Papilla, back it out, hit the reverse button, and then just reverse it back out. And then I do the 90 degree one. It's going in. Hit the stop button, hit the backup button, hit the start button, and back it out. It's really an easy procedure when you do it this way, but you can only do it this way if you turn the tip head uh, at a 30 degree angle from the main body. If you guys want to Facebook message me, I can take a photo of it uh, tomorrow or you can email me 
um, and I'll, I'll walk you through how to set up your power driver like this, but pretty straightforward. A couple of dimples, a little bloody, and then we're back in business. Um, of course, this doesn't want to get out now, right? So we're, we're back in business um, after that. So I'm gonna open this up to some questions. If you guys see my emails down at the bottom, feel free to reach out to me. Um, that's it for, for everything. Let me look. So, all right, let me blow this up and then take some questions. What does he do? So, so there are, so Richard Portalupi, there are members of the profession who are very critical of the lack of sound scientific support for accelerated devices such as vPro5. What reference might I use to support using vPro5? I can have reps reach out to you and get all of the science behind it. There is science out there um, that support it. Um, it, yes, there's some science out there that doesn't support it, um, but our profession is pretty, usually pretty much uh, about 20 years behind in accepting something that actually works. Um, <laughs> so Richard also asked, how, how many chocolate chip cookies did you earn <laughs> per visit on your mom? My mom doesn't cook, I wish she did, um, but none. So um, what does he do if there's root proximity on a CBCT? So if you look at the thickness of, so that, that's clear for Ari. If you look at the thickness of um, the tip for the driver, it's a, about 1.8 millimeters. So if you carefully lace it, it's like placing a tad in between um, two tooth roots. So it's like anything, it's just repetitive in procedure. You get better with tactile sense. I've never, I've hit a root with, with tads before uh, that always healed itself. You can feel the difference. The, pa the patient can, can feel it even if they're numb. Um, they've all healed. I have never hit a root with the PT driver. Um, I, I feel like the tactile sensation is a little bit better than my tad hand driver. So, you know, obviously we don't want to go through roots, but I've never um, hit a, a, a root before with the PT driver. So, Don Demas asked, how did you turn to do a mop a second time? So, you, so Don, you'll, you'll kind of see um, things kind of run out of gas. You'll see your movements going along really well and then they kind of just don't anymore. And that's with a repetitive mop comes back in. I, I'm just completely subjective. I would say 70 to 80% of the time I do mops, I do it once. And then vPro5, I kind of just like keep it going a little bit longer. I usually don't do a ton of cases where I need Microosteo perforations multiple times because I'm not doing crazy complicated movements or trying to accelerate things that fast. Um, but you'll see your movements run out of gas at a certain point. So I also have um, do I incorporate? So from Don, do you incorporate the costs and add ons for MOPS or B Pro 5 into the fee or is it an add on? So I bundle everything together at my initial case fee. If they don't accept, so vPro5, I give it out because I like the predictability. I do not charge for it. But microosteoperforations, or that's what I call acceleration, where I call um, vPro5, it's not acceleration, it's called predictability, and that's how I sell it in, in the consult room. Um, I don't sell predictability. I count on predictability to make myself profitable. 
we sell acceleration with micro, micro osteoperforations, and that's a bundle charge. So we charge uh, an extra 800 bucks for it, not a ton. If they don't buy it and they're kind of on the fence, they could add it on at any point, but I would rather have my fee bundled up front um, than to try to like piece it out, if that makes any sense. So Trent, uh Nesman, what clear buttons do you like to use? So I use clear buttons. They're ceramic from Ortho Technology now. Um, they're kind of a pain to put on because they're really small and they don't have a big grip. I use a positive positioning uh, posterior bracket holder to put on all of my sixes and sevens to hold on to the tubes. It's like a Keats clamp, but it's positive. So I use that to put on my buttons and I come in from the side to place them. Um, I use those, they're aesthetic, they're, you can barely uh, see them in your aligner patients. And I always hit them at the gingival margin. So when they smile, they kind of get lost outside of the attachment, but that's what I use. I don't use um, the the jigs or the, the mold formers anymore because the adhesive kind of yellows over time. So Lily, how do I convince uh, patients to do mops? What is your spiel? And pretty much what I said, like, I don't push mops. If you want it faster, then you pay for faster and it involves micro osteoperforations. Yes, it's a small surgical procedure. We do small dimples through the gum tissue into the bone. The gum tissue has nerves in it, the bone doesn't. So I give you a little bit of local anesthetic, a little bit of Novocaine, you won't feel it. You know, that night you'll be eating normally, the next day you won't even know that it's there and your teeth will move faster. If you want your teeth to move faster, this is what we have to do. And for that price, there's a small acceleration charge and that's 800 bucks. It's not a hard sell, it's just like a fact. And you show them a couple of cases of finishes and what you could accomplish in that time. Those acceleration patients come in wanting acceleration, so they're already kind of sold. You just have to walk them through how easy the procedure is. Um, what kind of informed consent do you have the patient sign for mop? It's pretty much a, a TAD, a temporary anchorage device and consent form that we're gonna use local anesthetic, we're gonna place these in. Every once in a while, you know, a root might get hit, it's not a big deal. Studies show that they heal, blah, 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 blah. It's in their general consent forms when they start their case, when they come in and sign contracts, it's an extra waiver uh, for the micro osteoperforations. It's the same one as the TAD one with a different name on the top of it. So can you feel the tip going through the cortical plate? I have a hard time feeling, feeling this. Uh, yes, I can, because it doesn't really take off until it's through the cortical plate. You can, you can feel it going through the gingival tissue and then it kind of like spins, 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 and boom, it takes off. That's it going through the cortical plate. Um, I cannot feel it going by cortical through the other side. I use visual to make sure that it goes through. I have a, um, a, a flat mirror. It's called a flecta mirror. I use disposable mirrors in all of my procedures because I can't stand the scratched mirrors. Um, I use a flecta mirror with light on the inside to make sure it goes through. But yeah, you can definitely feel it when it goes in on the front uh, with the power driver. It's add on a corporate fee or additional fees. I already went over that. Do you charge a higher fee for MOPS cases or do you include them? We also went over that. I bundle them, right? Um, so Jay, what is the name of the cheek retractor that you use? It's called an Optergate. So they come in either a mixed pack, you can buy them through Shine or Patterson, I don't know where the girls get them now. They come in um, single use packages, you toss them after you're done. Um, they come in three different sizes, you can buy them in a pack of 100, which is what we do of all three sizes because we use them regularly, or you can buy a assorted pack where it gives you like 20 of each one. It's a junior, it's a small, which is an adult small, and then a regular, which is an adult regular large. So phase one kids, when they get uh, bond repositioned, if I need to get posterior, they get a junior. Um, adolescents, uh, you know, into teens, all get a small, and then adult small, and then adults typically get a large 
unless they're females, the female that I showed you the video on had an adult small, you'll know once you use them. And they come in, they look like this, you know, you saw the photos, they look like a bass mouth. And um, you pinch them together, make like a taco, you stick them on right vestibule, left vestibule in, and then you pull the lips up and then they stay in there as long as the patients don't flex their lips. They're awesome. They, once you start using those, you can get direct visualization all the way back to the six. Uh, you know, they're, they're great. So uh, high frequency vibration for all Invisalign from Damas. Uh, how about fixed cases? So yes, all Invisalign, um, unless it's like crazy simple stuff like a light or like 10 aligners that is like really stupid, like first order movements, then, you know, I can't charge enough for those cases, you know, to, uh, to say I'm going to blow 300 bucks on, um, on a high frequency vibration. But outside of those cases, everybody gets them. Everybody gets them. And I forgot to go over this in my presentation. I tell all of my adult patients to leave them in the car, leave them in their cup holder or their change drawer in the car, because that's the most predictable time that I've found to tell them to use it. Because other than that, they leave it at home and then they forget to do it and they're not always in the same spot. I'm like, you guys are in your car every single day. Chew on this thing for five minutes at a stoplight throw it in while you're driving somewhere um and that's what they do and they found that to be pretty pretty uh easy is there anyone you wouldn't do a mop on yeah i mean uh and that's moon young so yeah i mean anybody that is obviously systemically compromised that i don't want to give local anesthetic for or that i don't want to bleed in my chair uh you know white glove patients it's just not worth it you know there's enough patients out there if they're a pain in the butt i'm not going to do it you know if they can't work with me on a procedure that's progressive to kind of do something a little bit faster then i'm not going to work with them and then i don't do it it's like any other patient though you know if you have a phase one kid that's throwing a temper tantrum and they need phase one ortho and they're not getting phase one ortho because it's all elective so i pick and choose my patients based upon what I want to do. Um, but as far as, you know, different types of cases, I don't do super, super tough cases or I haven't done super, super tough cases that need three, four rounds of mops yet, just because I haven't had the, the patient demand. Would I do it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you need to use a hand to stabilize the gate? No, you do not need a hand. It stays in by itself. I do use my fingers to use it to retract the cheek to get better visibility, but you leave those things in and they stay in there. Um, damn it, Evan Schwartz, let's go Yankees. You know as I'm a Red Sox fan. Um, thanks for sharing. So, LP. So, so Penipa asked me about um, telling us a protocol for high frequency vibration. I use it across the board just because I want predictability. Um, as far as high frequency, if I'm using mops, I'm also using high frequency vibration. I use high frequency vibration on my adult braces cases that want pain relief. I use some sensitive teenager patients that are in braces that want pain relief. Um, there's studies, there is science out there that shows that it reduces pain and anecdotally asking patients could be a placebo effect or not. They believe that it does. Um, high frequency vibration, it vibrates at a high frequency, like really, really vibrates. So they have to kind of be uh, prepped for that, that it's going to want to rattle the teeth out of their head as a couple of patients have said but if you bite down on it firmly not try to grind through it after a couple of times almost everybody has gotten used to it um and yeah it's so I, I i use it on my braces cases that want pain relief um i started using it on some uh retention 
relapse cases that haven't been wearing their Essex retainers. So instead of send, selling them a new Essex reset Essex retainer, they get their original Essex retainer that doesn't fit so well anymore. And I sell them a $300 uh, v pro 5 that seats their old essex retainer and pushes their teeth back straight so that's been pretty successful but we're just trying that out thomas shipley uh told me about that and it's been working out pretty good so i have not jay I've, i have not had a ton of success with insurance for mops but i'm also a big picture guy and i'm a little lazy so i know that they do um they do put in for it, but I would say less than 30% of the time there's been any payment and then it comes out of their dental, um, which, you know, I don't, my pedo ortho model, I don't have a ton of referrals outside of my practice now, but I always try to be careful of pissing off my referral source. So I usually don't charge insurance for it. I know there is a way you can talk to your rep. They can reach out to you. I haven't had a ton of great success for that, but I kind of big picture look beyond it. So, uh, so Amu Young, uh, you can use the you can use the um, power driver for tads. I don't use it for that, but you can use it to uh, do starter holes and then place tads. I believe it's a very similar jill driver to the RMO one. Um, you'd have to look into that. I don't use it for that, um, but you can. So movements. So so Brian Fryer, you know which movements are using Invisalign? Do I slow movement down now? Um, I slow movements, uh, deep bite movements, where I'm extruding posterior T fours, fives and sixes and intruding lower three to three. I still slow those down because I don't want to outpace the, the beveled rectangular attachments. I do Nicosis's uh, intrusion protocol where it's 60% lower three to three, 40% extrusion in the buccal segments. I, I slow those down. I slow down root uprighting. Like if you had to, um, throw a lower three root distally and use optimized root control attachments or big vertical attachments. I slow those down as well. And I also slow when I do arch expansion across aligners and I throw in more than 10 degrees of buckle root torque while I'm getting arch development, expansion, whatever you want to call it. I slow those movements down to keep the cusp seated around those molars. I don't want the molars to slip out because they tend to tip out. Um, have you had patients experience excess mobility in the anterior of the V-Pro 5 in one week changes? I have not. I have not done. I haven't. Um, I would assume, you know, that it's, all it is is, you know, accelerated bone remodeling. The bone doesn't get that soft. It's it's not like you have class two mobility or class three mobility. Teeth get loose when you move them, especially the patient that I showed you with uh, reduced periodontal support. I mean, teeth are going to get loose. You just have to prepare them for it up front. But nobody's uh, complained and I haven't clinically witnessed like two plus mobility. One, yeah, absolutely. But that's kind of normal, right? Um, any contraindication for using high frequency, some systemic diseases, also for mops such as bleeding disorder? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if they have bleeding disorders and low platelet counts and all that stuff that you wouldn't want to, them to bleed, I'm not going to use it. As far as high frequency vibration, um, not that I know of. Um, I don't know of any contraindications for that, any systemic diseases, but yeah, you know, if they have leukemia, lymphomas, things that affect their blood counts and their platelet counts, I'm not going to use it. If they have sickle cell or, or any of those other, you know, things that would flag my braces or regular Invisalign cases, I'm not going to use it. They're not going to be a good candidate. They're, like I said, there are so many patients out there um, that don't take the chance on those things play it safe. Like this is a progressive, you know, procedure that's kind of on the cusp, but you know, if you don't feel comfortable with treating those patients regularly, don't do it with micro osteo perforations. All right. Any other, any other questions, guys?
I'm going to sign off and get my kids to bed. Cool. Awesome. Hey, BJ. All right, guys. Have a good night. It was uh, fun doing this. Thanks.